Hello my friends, let's talk Bloodborne, the highly technical prodigy of the original Souls game. The rabid lore community that built around Dark Souls had a field day with the mid-game reveal of eldritch Lovecraftian horrors plaguing this world of werewolves and witches. But, as is always the case for the Souls formula for narrative structure, fascination is high, but actual knowledge and meaning is difficult to grasp. I believe that I have uncovered the true meaning behind the philosophy of Bloodborne the solution to the mind-body paradox. We have all heard the statement, the mind is what the brain does, and despite our social and scientific consensus on this statement, humanity still ponders the distance between our bodies and the experience of mind. The mind-body paradox is the conclusion that the human being is just the body that it has, and yet most all of us have the subjective experience of being a mind that is in some way separate or in control of the body. The experience of mind is that of having a body while being a consciousness. For ages, we as a species have tried to solve this discrepancy, but we have yet to find an answer that bridges the gap in a satisfying way. We do not know the truth of mind and body yet. In Bloodborne, the path to this truth comes with an impossible discovery, the blood of a god, and a symbol of birth, an umbilical cord. Strap in, my friends. We have a lot to learn and a lot to remember. The College of Bergenworth discovered the chalice dungeons while conducting research, and within they found the old blood and the umbilical cord of an ancient god as well. Willem, provost of the College of Bergenworth, focused the study of the college toward the umbilical cord of the Great Ones and had an epiphany, the need for eyes on the inside of his brain. As described on the Carol rune inscribed with the word I, Willem thought that doing so would elevate the mind beyond the limits of human thought, and allow him to think on the higher planes of the Old Ones and the Celestials. Now, when I did my evaluation on the philosophy of Dark Souls 3, it was important to take notice of the player character's information to get an idea of the meaning behind the mechanics. The first that comes to mind for Bloodborne is of course, the Insight stat which represents how much our character has had their mind exposed to the incomprehensible in the form of any of the beasts, old ones, or celestials that make for the bosses in the game. Your level of insight correlates to how susceptible you are to the frenzy status effect, which is widely accepted as being the result of the player being forced to think about the incomprehensible too fast, and the resulting effect on the player's body. The arcane stat measures the player's strength of wielding the power that comes from knowledge of the gods. The empty phantasm shell, said to be a familiar of the Great One, has slime that harbors arcane power. This power can be spread onto weapons to give it a blue celestial glow. It's interesting to note that pretty much everything that is involved with Great Ones or Celestials shares this blue color scheme. The aliens, the magic from the lesser amygdalas, and the more mysterious connection to the lightning of the Dark Beasts. Raising the arcane stat also increases item discovery, a mechanical nod to being able to find items, to discover new things more easily. In looking to grow eyes on the inside, to see and understand the mind, the college took to blinding their own eyes to focus on introspection, losing sight of the rest of the world. Bergenworth also discovered the old blood in the chalice dungeons, and in studying the blood under Provost Willem, it is discovered that imbibing the blood can cure the body of any injury or disease. But Provost Willem warned caution from his famous adage, We are born from the blood, made men by the blood, undone by the blood. Our eyes have yet to open. Fear the old blood. But his student Lawrence thought this to be the wrong path, and left to found the healing church. The healing church instead focused on the blood itself, and used the practice of blood healing to gain favor with the public and further their research. The White Church Guard set states, they believe that medicine is not a means of treatment, but rather a method of research, and that some knowledge can only be obtained by exposing oneself to sickness. From the Metamorphosis and the Beast runes, we know that the discovery of blood made their dream of evolution a reality. And, with the discovery of blood, entailed the discovery of undesirable beasts. The healing church developed under Lawrence not to minister blood healing as the church claimed, but to use it as research to see the effects of greater intake of old blood 
and the evolution the church aimed for, and it did work, albeit with mixed success, and a few failures along the way. First, the beastly scourge, brought on by spreading the ashen blood plague through the very blood healing that could heal anything else. Second, the vile blood stolen from and condemned by the church. Drinking of this blood transformed people into sanguine, vampire-like creatures. Both beasts and vile bloods craved blood into madness, because, as we know, blood is more intoxicating than even alcohol. And it's kind of funny how one failure resulted in making werewolves and the other failure resulted in making vampires. I never noticed that before. But don't be mistaken. It is not the case that only bad blood, like ashen blood or vile blood, creates beasts. The Sword Hunter badge reads, Clerics turned into the most hideous of beasts. And this is proven multiple times, by Ludwig the Cleric Beast, Gascoigne the Hunter's Transformation, and Vicar Amelia's Transformation. The greater beastly transformation, I believe, is from the Church's greater access to the old blood. They imbibe more blood, and thus the greater the evolution. In the end, Lawrence regretted his decision to split from Provost Willem's teachings. He leaves a note that reads, Evolution without courage will be the ruin of our race. Now the interpretation of the word courage here has made a bit of confusion over the years, but most likely it was translated from the Japanese word yuki, which can also be translated as nerve, or the connotation of mental fortitude, and not simply bravery. Once again, turning to the player information, the heads-up display, and what that can tell us. The most obvious is the blood vials we use to heal ourselves. The description hints that this is the same blood used in blood healing, the old blood. Just like the Yarnamites, we are heavy users of this blood. The blood echoes continue this theme. And while most of the stats focus on the body, blood tinge directly relates to how powerfully our blood affects others. To parallel frenzy is beasthood, the only resistance that we increase for the sake of stronger effects from the status, which we activate by consuming the concentrated beast blood pellets. The beast status poetically makes you stronger, but more susceptible to damage. Since beasthood is mostly determined by your armor, my headcanon says that the stat is determined by how much old blood was soaked into the armor before you got it. But that's not terribly important. So the history of the college seems straightforward enough. The College of Bergenworth focused on the evolution of the mind through the arcane and through eyes on the inside of the brain. The Healing Church pursued evolution of the body through blood ministration. Both went to excess in their pursuits. Bergenworth students became gross fly creatures, became trapped in nightmares like the school of Mensis, and lost their bodies, or grew celestial growths and died just like Provost Willem himself. Healing Church followers became hideous, bloodthirsty beasts and lost their minds. Two complete opposites, right? No, not really. I had a revelation of my own when I took notice of two items in particular, the sedatives and the blue elixir. At first glance you would assume the sedatives, with their very apparent connection to blood, was a tool of the healing church. Same with the blue elixir and its arcane glow, we would assume that it was connected to the College of Bergenworth. But to my surprise, the exact opposite was true. The sedatives are a liquid concocted at Bergenworth, out of thick human blood, to calm the nerves and avoid falling into madness, but also results in a reliance on blood ministration. But we know that blood ministration heals through the use of the old one's blood, not normal human blood. The blue elixir is first described as a dubious liquid used in experiments of the healing church. It is an anesthetic that numbs the brain and reduces a hunter's presence when consumed. Very little is actually given to us in terms of information about the blue elixir. It becomes purchasable after obtaining the Cosmic Eye Watcher badge. We receive some from killing the NPC in Bergenworth Manor, and we receive blue elixir as a reward for the celestial that poses as Yosefka. The blue elixir is therefore likely produced directly from celestials, though, for my money, I'm willing to bet that the researchers at Bergenworth developed blue elixir from the slime of the empty phantasm shell which we find just above the MPC that gives us the blue elixir. So Bergenworth wanted evolution of the mind, but in doing so, saw the body go into a frenzy when the mind learned too much arcane knowledge too quickly. So they used an antidote made from the old blood to suppress the body. The healing church used old blood to cause rapid evolution of the body, but in doing so, 
saw people's brains go wild and beast-like, so they used the arcane blue elixir to suppress the mind's reaction, and thus enable pushing the body even further. You need the poison to make the cure, after all. As one final piece of evidence, there is one line in the game that fully summarizes the juxtaposition of the mind and the body as a paradox. When we first enter the boss fight with Mikolash, the host of the nightmare, he delivers a line that sums up the entire game's metaphorical meaning. Some say cos, others cosm. As you did for the vacuous rum, grant us eyes, grant us eyes. Cos and cosm are not just empty words, but clues to be followed. Cos references the hometown of Hippocrates, the father of Western medicine, and famed for the Hippocratic Oath. While he wasn't the originator of the theory, Hippocrates was largely responsible for the spread of the Four Humors theory of medicine, that being bile, phlegm, black bile, and of course, blood. Cos thus refers to the Four Humors, and therefore also the aspects of blood and body being driven forth in blood-born. Then there is cosm. Cosm refers to the etymology of the word cosmic, with the Greek kosmikos. As this reference, the juxtaposition of cos and cosm is thus between cos, the body, and the blood, with cosm, the mind, the arcane, the cosmic. This line by Mikolash so perfectly represents the meaning of Bloodborne, because it is showing the struggle and the pursuit to understand the juxtaposition of body and mind. And this is further emphasized when we finally kill Mikolash, and his dying words are not cursing you, but cursing that he will forget everything he's learned in pursuit of that knowledge. We have one main faction trying to obtain the mind of a god, and the other main faction trying to obtain the body of a god, but neither of them succeeded, both of them trying to suppress the aspect of the other's method. Our hunter, however, is different. We start as a foreigner, unhindered by the social walls that plagued the people of this land. We spend the game imbibing hundreds of vials of blood, as well as the blood of NPCs. We strengthen our blood with their echoes through the blood tinge stat. We gain more and more insight as we encounter bosses, but also consume Madman's knowledge and Great One's wisdom. We strengthen our mind with the Arcane stat, and, most importantly, we consume an entire umbilical cord of a Great One, the key that opened Provost Willem's mind. The three endings of Bloodborne test if you have grasped the meaning being shown to us. With ending number one, you leave the hunter's dream to be a normal person again. You leave the dream, the mind, to be just a body in the world. Ending number two, you take German's place in the hunter's dream. Like German, your body becomes useless and you become bound into the mind. And with the true ending, if you have gained the body of a great one through blood and mind of a great one through insight, you usurp being from the moon presence and become an infant great one yourself. You have fully grasped the aspects of body and mind and achieved metamorphosis where Bergenworth and the Healing Church failed. They wanted to become gods. So this raises the hardest question of the whole game. What is a god? Much like the lesser amygdalas, the answer to this question has been hidden from us, but plainly in sight from the beginning. The first great one you may have encountered is Amygdala, found and killed in the Nightmare Frontier. Next, Rom the Vacuous Spider, found and killed in the Moonside Lake. And, while there are others, I want to skip to the moon presence, found and killed in the hunter's dream. What these three have in common is that they all exist within their own realms, both separate from but connected to the setting of Bloodborne, other than Amygdala as an entirely optional boss. Killing Rom resulted in the Blood Moon, a massive change to the world state. Even killing bosses that are not great ones, whether it be just bodies like Vicar Amelia or just minds like Mikolash, the world state changes as well. If an ascended mind like Mikolash can exist as a world within a mind, and an ascended body has a physical effect on the world itself, then fully ascended great ones are both. 
a god is a being where thought and embodied reality are one and the same, not just a mind that thinks or a body that lives, but where mind is body and body is mind. Bloodborne posits that the mind-body paradox is only a problem because of the kind of thing that we are, because of the limits of the human being. To solve the paradox, we must ascend to greater heights. We must become a being where thought and being are one. Thank you for watching, everyone. If you liked this video or found it a useful refresher course, please share with your friends and like the video. I don't pay to advertise at all, so the only way this channel can grow is with your help. If I missed some of the important ideas or themes of Bloodborne, please comment and let me know. If you like the channel and want to help me continue analyze video games and the philosophical ideas and influences therein, consider heading to patreon.com slash Socratetris and becoming a patron. If you donate even just one dollar a month, I'll make a personal thank you video to release at the start of the month. I will see you again, good hunters. May you find your worth in the waking world. And, as always, stay true.